You can take your Bibles and turn to Nehemiah chapter number two. Nehemiah chapter two. I think that Brother Rule and I both had a desire today um, to prepare hearts to receive the vision for next week. And this morning we learned that faith is the victory. You cannot have a godly vision without a step of faith. There's got to be that step of faith that shows that we are dependent upon God. Something beyond our comfort zone, something beyond our, our confidence cannot be in ourselves, but rather in Christ as we heard this morning as well. Nehemiah chapter number two. Now, I, I'm sure it is completely because of my ignorance, but how about you? Does everyone know what 2020 vision means? I know that there would be several in here, but uh, there may be some of us that didn't know. So, um, I don't know, about a week ago or so, I thought like, okay, we're coming in this 2020 thing. Everyone's going to talk about 2020 vision. So what exactly is 2020 vision? So... This is what it means. It's pretty simple. It means that 20 feet away, that is, that there's a line, and I don't even know what line it is or whatever on the chart, that normal people can read that line from 20 feet away. So I thought that was kind of interesting because there's not really a standard. It's just that normal people well, already, I know I'm in danger with that, but... Uh, <laughs> That normal people at 20 feet away can read a certain line or certain letters on that line. 2040 eyesight means that you see at 20 feet what others, normal people, see at 40 feet. Okay, so that means you're pretty nearsighted and not too good on the farsighted thing. You're not able to see that well. 2060 means that you're seeing things at 20 feet that the majority people can see at 60 feet. And beyond that, don't be driving, okay? Don't be driving. All right, unless you get some prescription glasses, I guess. Now, there is a thing called 2010. That means you see things at 20 feet that normal people see at 10 feet. So that means you get some really good eyesight there, you know. Uh, so that's what it means, 2020 vision. Uh, in looking up vision, I had to look up the old eagle as well. Uh, again, some of you may know this, but this, when you stop and consider this, this is amazing. That an eagle can see objects two miles away. And let me tell you what kind of objects, okay? So I can see the mountains two miles, okay. <laughs> Eagles can see, all right, an eagle flying over the parking lot out there can see a rabbit at Walmart two miles away, can see a rabbit. That is absolutely amazing vision. You know, I really will, I mean this honestly after being here for seven years, pastor has a vision that I just have not seen in normal people. I don't know what, he, what you would call it on a, spiritual, on, a, on a spiritual caliber, but pastor sees things and sees where we can go as a church. Like, I'll just be honest. Like, I don't know of anyone else. And then he can cast that vision. So Brother Rule and I, this Sunday, really wanted to prepare our hearts you can't have a vision without faith. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 and 5 was laid out today about that. But I want to talk to you about vision. I've entitled my message, Good Vision Leads to Great Victory. Good vision leads to great victory. Look with me, if you would, at Nehemiah chapter number 2. And um, let's stand for the reading of God's word, if we could. Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 17, it says this. Then we'll remain standing for a word of prayer. Then said I, that would be Nehemiah. We'll talk a little bit about the context of this book in just a moment. Then said I unto them, ye see the distress that we are in. How Jerusalem lieth waste and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come 
and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem that we be no more a reproach. There's the vision. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. Why did they strengthen their hands for this good work? They saw the vision that Nehemiah had for their city. Father, we, we do not know what will happen this week. And I believe that every one of us as your children, if we heard the trumpet this week, that would be the greatest thing in the world. That this would be the week that Christ would come back for his bride. That this is the week that Christ would come back for the church. Father, if pastor never got to give his vision, but we got to see the vision of your son and spend an eternity in heaven, that would be amazing. Nothing greater could ever happen. So we preface this message by, if the Lord will. But Father, if you will, and you tarry, your son tarries, and we're in this auditorium next Sunday, I pray that the way that we receive the vision, and Lord, we're not talking about anything spooky. You know, you know what we're all talking about, Father, what, what we've heard for the last 33 years from this under shepherd. Father, that direction that you want us to take as a church from the set of eyes that you've given, all of us have parts in this body of Lancaster Baptist Church. Our eyes will be back here next week who's guided and directed us. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that we will receive the vision that the direction that we want to go for the cause of Christ in our valley and in our world like we've never received it before. But then I pray one other thing. Father, I believe that whatever we're responsible for, we should have a vision for it. So, Father, if we're responsible for our family and we're a parent, if we're responsible for our marriage and we're a husband, if we're responsible for a class that we teach, or whatever we have in our in responsibility in the occupation that you've called us, I pray that we would also have a vision for whatever we're responsible for. And may the things tonight help us. May the truths that we hear about vision help us in our responsibilities. And then, Lord, every one of us have a responsibility over our lives. And, Lord, may we be good stewards of our walk with you this year by having a vision where you want us to go. Then, Lord, a couple other things. I want to thank you for our pastor. May his time, whatever he's got left, with his wife and family be sweet, and may he come back fired up. We, we take that for granted that we know that he will. Well, we don't know that. Father, he needs your power this week. I pray you'll protect his health in and every area. Then, Lord, I want to take a moment and thank you for the teenagers from Lancaster Baptist that just sang. I pray, Lord, that's part of our vision here. I, I, just to see those young people up here, I, I envision them going on to serve you. And so, Lord, just for what we just heard, that was a blessing. I pray the book of Nehemiah would help us now in 2020. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And God's church said, Amen. you may be seated. So just a little historical background. This, by the way, is really one of the very last books written in the Old Testament, probably around 444 B.C. And really, Malachi is probably the only book that would follow Nehemiah. Israel was in captivity for 70 years. When Israel finally got out of captivity, they came back from their captivity in waves. The first wave was under King Zerubbabel. I love that name, so let's all say it together. King Zerubbabel. 
I just love that name. King Zerubbabel brought the first group of people back from captivity. When they got back to Jerusalem, they began to rebuild the temple. By the way, this is a good point for all of us coming into Vision Sunday, is the old people really put a wet blanket on the whole deal. The old people go like, oh, that temple isn't anything like Solomon's temple. Oh, you guys should have seen Solomon's temple. And the young people were like, well, you know, what do we do, you know? And they actually stopped working on rebuilding the temple because the old people put such a wet blanket on the whole thing and just were like, oh, that's no good. Two guys are spring up that God uses. One is Haggai. Haggai says, no, man, we got to get back to doing God's work. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added on to you. Hey, we got to get back. You guys aren't doing so good by putting up your own houses and everything. Come on, we got to get back to work. Consider is the key word there in Haggai. And then Zechariah, and I kind of like Zechariah. So Haggai is the real practical guy. Like, come on, man, we got to get back to working on the temple. Zechariah is the real spiritual guy. He says, you know what? Folks, this temple's going to actually be better than Solomon's temple. <laughs> How could this temple be better than Solomon's temple? Because the Messiah is going to come into this temple. And that really gets the people excited, like, woo, we got to get this temple built because the Messiah is going to come in. And by the way, the Messiah did come into that temple that Zechariah preached that, that, that was rebuilt. So Zerubbabel brings the first group. Then the second group comes by a really godly Bible teacher named Ezra. Ezra is one of the most godly men in the Old Testament as you study. There is, a, uh, uh, there is such a depth to Ezra's uh, ministry, his message, the way he prepared his heart. And so he comes back and preaches the word. But then a third group comes back. And that's the group we center on right now, and that's Nehemiah. For even though the temple did finally get rebuilt, and even though Ezra preached great messages, the people were still spiritually dead because the boundaries and the fences were not built up properly. Moms and dads, that's a great truth for us to learn. That until the fences are built up and the boundaries of protection are built up for those that are within, you're not going to really ever experience revival. Praise God for the fences of protection we put around our children. Praise God for the fences of protection we put around uh, those here in the church. We all need that. So Nehemiah comes back and he comes back and in 52 days, they rebuild the walls all around Jerusalem. And there's a great revival at a place called Watergate in Nehemiah chapter 8. But what I want to shoot a see tonight, and we're going to be kind of jumping around in the first four chapters of Nehemiah. What I want you to see tonight is good vision leads to great victory. Well, I thought the first thing we needed was a definition of vision. And um, I don't think, again, this is anything mystical or spooky or like Pastor Chapel has something we don't have or anything like that. I don't think that's what we're talking about. Many people could probably give a better definition, but in the realm that we're dealing with uh, of looking forward to the direction, this is what I put down, vision. A direction revealed by the Lord to take a step of faith. A direction revealed by the Lord to take a step of faith. I cannot stress enough that anything that is a godly vision will have a step of faith attached to it. It's the only way we can please God. So if God is leading in an area, there would have to be faith that would have to be a part of that. A direction revealed by the Lord to take a step of faith. Now, let me go back to the prayer I prayed tonight. If you're a dad, you ought to ask the Lord to give you your next step of faith in your family and home. That in 2020, you may go in a direction. And by the way, sometimes we look at this thing and we think like, okay, we're going this direction. Now we're going to go this direction. No, you know what? Sometimes it's just a little direction change. Dance. 
Don't feel this huge pressure to completely change the direction of your marriage and your kids and your family in 2020. No. Just maybe make a little change. You know, we're going to start doing this as a family. It's not going to be much different than what we're doing already. Hey, we're just going to start having three meals a week together where we sit down and talk. And we're just going to clear the table and we're going to talk. We're not going to talk about major things that are going to happen in 2020. And oh boy, are things going to change in our marriage? No, just little things. And that can have a huge profound impact in your life and your ministry. If you're a teacher in your class, we're not talking about drastic changes, but just changing things a little bit to help. Authority figure. If you're an authority figure, you ought to have a vision. What I prayed in my prayer is for me as well as for everyone here. Whatever you're responsible for, you ought to have a vision for that. That's the only wise thing of being a good steward. So let's look at these things and we'll be out of here. Number one, godly vision always comes from deity. Well, if it's godly vision, it comes from God. Take your Bibles and look back at Nehemiah chapter one for just a moment. Well, Brother Shetler, how do you know that the vision is from God? Well, I think you could give more than the four points I'm about to give you. You might have some other things, but I do think that the four things I'm about to give you, how you can determine if it's from God or not, is a very legitimate way. Be, okay, we're talking about all this vision stuff. I mean, how do you know that this is a vision that God wants you to take or the, our direction that the Lord wants you to take? Well, let me give you four things. Number one, especially in the realm of a church or an institution or whatever, the discernment from godly leadership. The discernment from godly leadership. In other words, I think leadership determines the need. Hey, you know what? We got a need right now in our family. We got a need right now in our, in our connection group. We got a need right now in this area that I'm over. There's a need. And I think that discernment comes from godly leadership. Look at chapter one and verse number four. So some relatives come back to the captivity where Nehemiah is as the cupbearer. And Nehemiah wants to know immediately what's going on in Jerusalem, and it's not good. Verses 1 through 3 is a terrible description about what's happening. Things are in disarray. They're spiritually dead. Things are not good. Look at verse 4. And it came to pass, when I heard these words. I want to stop here. Apparently, from what I've gathered, our leadership of our church, Pastor Chapel and others, have done a lot of research about this valley. Apparently, from what I've gathered, Pastor has really let it open to say, hey, what do we need to do? How do we reach this community in 2020? As far as I understand, our pastor and his leadership team of this church has looked into more than they ever have before of what the needs are. The discernment from godly leadership. Look at verse number 11 of the same chapter. O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant. See, now this is interesting. And to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name and prosper. I pray thee, thy servant this day. We're going to come back to that word desire in a moment. And grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupper. And you say, well, Brother Shetler, it seems to me like Nehemiah is coming up with his own vision. Well, this is very interesting. The discernment of godly leadership sees the need, takes the lead. That sees, you know what? There is something going on in Jerusalem that we need to repair. I really believe that if we can reach the children of AV and the children in the culture that we live in today, how children dictate so much of what parents do and where they go and the time that they have. If we can do this and direct this way, how we could possibly still be a huge impact for the gospel of Christ. 
So the discernment from godly leadership, by the way, Brother Seller, so how do you get this discernment to this godly leadership? Hebrews chapter five, verse 14 says, they that exercise the use of the word develop discernment for good and evil. Huge verse, if you've never read it before. Hebrews 5, 14, if you're exercising that which you know you're supposed to be doing and using the word of God, God will give you discernment about that. So number one, godly vision always comes from deity. How do you know the visions from God? I think the discernment from godly leadership. Number two, the desire of other believers confirming the direction. Look with me in chapter two, our text tonight. Then said I unto them, ye see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come, let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we be no more reproach. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me. You wait, you'll see pastor do that next Sunday, I truly believe. As also the king's words that he had spoken unto me, and they said, let us rise up and build. They confirmed it. The desire of other believers confirming the direction. I think that's important. Number three. Now this one I thought about for a long time, but I've thought about in my life about vision that God has given. The delay of events and resources. Huh? I don't think I'm ready to say dogmatically, but the majority of time that God gives a vision of direction, there will usually be a death or a delay of that vision. But it doesn't make any sense. No, it doesn't make any sense. But let me tell you what happens during the delay. By the way, I think that his prayer in chapter one is in the, in the month Chislu. The time that he finally gets to talk to the king is Nisan. There's about a six month delay from when God put on his heart what he wanted to do in Jerusalem to the point that he can finally even express that vision. It's like six months. Why is there a delay, Brother Shetler? I think the delay is very important. And I, in my life, when God has given me a, a direction that I really believe I need to go, and God's, you know, like, God, I know this is what you want. There's usually a period of death or delay. What happens during that period is, you know what, God? I'm not gonna be able to do this. I can't make this happen. I know. That's why I've been delaying everything. Because I want you to see that this is not your doings. This is gonna be my doings. And I think after the Lord gives us a real impactful direction to go, usually things fall apart right after that. Because God is showing us this is not going to be a work of yours. This is going to be a work that I do. Well, I'll tell you, I don't know for sure everywhere we're going next Sunday. But I think a lot of the things that pastor is going to bring out has been delayed for a couple years. But I don't think that, to, yeah, are we sure we're going in there? I don't think there will ever be a vision that God, well, I don't know if I'd say dogmatically. But from what I can sense and I can see in the scriptures, there's usually a delay. Boy, that was really true with David about building the temple to begin with. There's usually sometimes a death of a vision or a delay. This signifies it will be God who does the work. Then the fourth thing that I wanted you to see, the details then at some point begin to come together. Details, resources, people, favor begin to come together. Look at chapter 2, verses 6 through 9, the conversation between Nehemiah and the king. Verse 6, and the king said unto me, the queen also sitting by him. I thought that was interesting. I think she's going to, with her compassionate heart, she's, I don't know what, but I think it was good that the queen was there. For how long shall thy journey be? And when wilt thou return? So it pleased the king 
to send me. Things started to come together. It took six months, and I set him a time. Moreover, I said unto the king, if it please the king, let letters be given me to the governors beyond the river that they may convey me uh, over till I come into Judah. And then look at verse 8. In a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace which uh, appertain to the house and for the wall of the city and for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. Hey, the details now are coming together. And these confirm, you know what, Lord, you're in this. I had the delay, I kind of thought, God, is this ever going to happen? And now you've brought it back again. And God, now you've provided the details, the delay, the desire, and the discernment. Number two, God, godly vision always comes from de deity. Number two, godly vision always brings clarity. It's said often, but it, it's going to be said again tonight. I don't know of anyone that brings and cast a vision with more clarity than Pastor Paul Chapel. I think he's gifted in this area, but it is important that whenever you cast a vision, godly vision always brings clarity. A vision must answer three questions. And I think this is, if for all of us that are in any kind of responsibility over people, you might want to write these down. Because after you give a direction, three things should be answered. Number one, now I know what we are doing. <laughs> number two, now I know why we are doing it. And number three, now I know how we are going to do it. If the Lord tarries, and Pastor Chapel speaks next Sunday from behind this pulpit, I guarantee you all three of those questions will be answered Sunday morning and Sunday night. Now I know what we are doing. Now I know why we are doing it. Now I know how we are going to get it done. I think chapter, I think that chapter 2, 17 and 18 it deals with this, but chapter 3 is very unique. There is no chapter in the Bible that has the word next, N-E-X-T, more in it than chapter 3, 15 times. Next unto him. Also the word build and repaired is not found in any other chapter in the scripture more often than in chapter 3. So what are you saying, Brother Shetler? So we got next unto him, we got the word build and the word repair. What is he doing? He is explaining what everyone's going to do, where everyone's going to be, and he's already given the why under in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 17 and 18. He has given absolute clarity. Everyone knows where they're supposed to be. Everyone knows their responsibility of what they're supposed to do. And the vision is given with incredible clarity. So, when we got accredited as a college, there was a team that came. And that team, after they were done assessing us for accreditation, gave us two commendations. Very unusual. Pastors mentioned this. Some others have mentioned this as well. Very unusual to have one. We got two. The one really impressed the team. There was a lady on the team named Dr. Raylene Cochran. Dr. Raylene Cochran used to be one of my teenagers in my youth group. Raylene Shimon is how I remember her. And Raylene said to me after they were here on site, she said, Pastor Shetler, we have done many site visits, but I've never seen a place that its students, that its faculty, that it's administration and that it's alumnus, the alumni are so clear on the direction of what, why West Coast exists. I said, Raylene, I gotta tell you something. That's one of the things that have always impressed me. I have never doubted what I'm supposed to be doing at West Coast Baptist College. We are training laborers for the harvest. It was so clear. 
That is a great place to work and minister in a place that has clarity of its vision and its goal. Again, I want to tell you something. You don't go to this church and not know why we're going to this church. And that clarity is so important. Godly vision always brings clarity. Godly vision always comes from deity. Number three, godly vision always creates activity. Godly vision always creates activity. Now, if I was in the ministry here, pick out one individual that probably his personality, his gifts and abilities are the antithesis of me, it would probably be Ben Hobbs. Where's Brother Hobbs? Okay, Brother Hobbs. Now, Brother, I love that man. Because one of the reasons why I love him is because he does everything I don't ever want to do. <laughs> and he might say the same thing about me. But Brother Hobbs and I are so vastly different in so many ways the way that we look at things. However, we sat in a workshop one time together. It was amazing. Two people that were so vastly different. At the end of the workshop, we both walked out, and if I'm not mistaken, we said it simultaneously, or he asked the question and I said it and he agreed. But I almost think that we said it simultaneously. What was that workshop la lacking? And we both said, I think at the same time, if we didn't say it right at the same time, I answered it and he said, that's exactly right. And what it lacked was task items. This guy gets up there for 45 minutes, 50 minutes. He gave philosophy and all, but he didn't give any task item. Okay, so what are we supposed to do with what we just heard? Now, I want to tell you something. This is really important. Vision will always create activity. There should be task items that you leave with next Sunday. There should be things that after you hear the vision for 2020 for Lancaster Baptist Church, you know what? I need to do this in my family. You know what? I need to do this in my personal life. You know what? I need to start doing this as a member of Lancaster. You should go away. And I'm telling you, our pastor is going to give you task items, okay? Vision, godly vision will always create activity. We see it in verse 18. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's word that he had spoken unto me. And they said, let us rise up and build. We got activity. Hey, we got stuff to do. Now, everyone can have their own favorite verse in Nehemiah, but mine is Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 6. This is my favorite verse in the book. You can have your own favorite. Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 6. So built we the wall, and all the wall was joined together unto the half thereof. 52 days, folks. For the people had a mind to, everyone together, work. Man, don't you just love that verse? Godly vision always creates activity. And there's three things. Someone should explain our opportunities. I think you'll find that happen next week. And then I think our, our connection leaders will expand on those. Someone should explain our opportunities. Number two, everyone should be moved to action. And number three, anyone should believe they can be a part. So godly vision will create activity. Someone should explain our opportunities. Everyone should be moved to action. And anyone should believe that they can be a part. Just two more and we're done. So godly vision comes from deity. Godly vision brings clarity. Godly vision creates activity. And number four, godly vision always needs humility. Always needs humility. Now, this is the most important element of vision is humility. Because the humility that a church, the person, a family, an individual displays will determine the grace that they receive to accomplish the vision. If we don't stay humble, if we, leave, if we left out of here next Sunday night like we are the best church in America, whoa. We ought to leave humbly like I'm excited and I'm thrilled, but oh Lord, God, I am humbled that you would call our church to go in this direction. And by the way, it's also humility. And you know what? Who cares who gets the credit as long as God gets the glory? 
This is what gives God the glory, is the humility. We all do our part. This is where we get the grace to accomplish the vision. This is how we come together as a team. The vision should be glorious enough not to be accomplished by human efforts alone. The vision should be glorious enough that, hum, that human endeavors cannot accomplish it. I truly believe that what we hear next Sunday, we, excuse the English, ain't going to be able to do it. But isn't that where God steps in? Isn't that God's part? We humble ourselves and do the part that God has for us and God takes over. Let me encourage you. Godly vision always needs humility. And then number five, godly vision always produces unity. Godly vision comes from deity. It brings clarity. It creates activity. It needs humility. But godly vision always produces unity. Now, I hope I'm not stealing any of his thunder, but almost every time pastors ever given vision, we always end up in Philippians, don't we? <laughs> Philippians chapter 1, right? And verse 27. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and you see, see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Godly vision always produces unity. Hey, sure, we've got this going on sometimes, and we have this, and we definitely struggle in different things in our church. Hey, I pastor two churches. I see things here, but I'm going to tell you, this is a very unified body. Let me, let me tell you what I, I see after being here for seven years. Not two deep pockets, but one huge heart together. Amen. We don't have rich people in this church, but I do sense a unified body of believers wanting to go forward for the cause of Christ. Vision, godly vision, will produce unity. Now, the unity comes out of the diversity. The unity isn't that we're, okay, we all got to be the same. Okay, just the thing I just said about Brother Hobbs and I. We're so different. But that brings great unity. Unity comes out of diversity, not out of sameness. We're all different. We all have different gifts and different abilities. When we use our diversity all for the same purpose, wow. Now this morning, I was trying to figure out an illustration for this, and I got it from Gary today. That, did you guys like that greatest thy faithfulness thing? Boy, Gary was on it today with, on, these, on these, uh, these kettle drums. Now, I don't know. I won't be able to play like him. But he was in his zone over here. And I thought this. While Gary was playing that greatest thy faithfulness, and he was going at it. If you would have eliminated the choir and you would have eliminated the rest of the orchestra, and all you would have heard was the kettle drums, you'd have gone like, wow, what in the world is that noise? <laughs> but the diversity of the kettle drums unified with the rest of the orchestra and the choir, did that sound cool or what? That was so great this morning. But if it would have been just the kettle drums, we're going like, "Wow, well, man, what, what are we here? What is that? But it was in unit. It was very diverse than any other instrument that we had going on. But it was unified and orchestrated together. Our unity comes out of our diversity. It's not bad that you have a different spiritual gift than other people. By the way, all Pastor Chapel is are the eyes. He ain't the hands. He's not the feet. He is very limited in what he can achieve if we're not all unified together. That unity comes out of our diversity.
Unity produces the pleasure of partnership. And I want to close with this. Take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 133. Psalm 133. A familiar verse, but just one that should ring out in 2020. And the stronger we get together, the more impact we have in our community. Unity and victory are going to be synonymous with each other. But unity produces the pleasure of partnership. Psalm 133, verse 1 and 3. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in, everyone together, unity. unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garments. Hey, Godly vision will produce a unity. Pastor says this, pastor's been saying this. Would you be willing to take a moment this week and pray for next week's vision? And here's what I want you to pray for. I know he's going to be really upset. Don't pray for Pastor Chapel. I'm serious. Pray for you. I think the sower will be fine. I think the seed will be magnificent. My biggest burden is the soil it falls on. Can I encourage you, church? Would you center your prayers on you this week? That you will receive that which God places in your heart, not a man, but God places in your heart in the direction. And you know what? He may, the Holy Spirit may put something on your heart that had nothing to do with what Paul Chapel said, but had everything to do with you as the husband of your home, you as the father, you as the head of that Sunday school class, you as the one that's over authority over people here in the community, your own business, whatever it might be, that God will take that and work that in your heart as your direction by your step of faith that has been revealed. I really mean this. I think given all things, pastor's going to be ready to go. I think the greatest concern, will we be ready to receive?